After they'd had their turn, the ordinary pilgrims were allowed to go. It's hard to believe that war was raging the rest of the world as the people of Larsa set off for their annual picnic season. South of Lhasa, there were many parks. During the first two weeks in May, it was picnic season. The quality of the tent depended on how rich you were. Poor people would just rig up a sheet or a small tent, but everyone went. People might picnic for one day or for longer, but on the 15th, everybody would go to their local place of worship and then come to the picnic. The nationalist Kuomintang government in China maintained its mission in Lhasa and even joined in with the Tibetan festivals. However, at home, the communists were growing in power and a civil war was raging. You see the flag there? It's the flag of the Chinese Kuomintang. In those days, the Chinese in Tibet were mainly the official representatives of the Kuomintang. The present Chinese hadn't arrived yet. Here you can see some people performing the incense burning ceremony. And here are some monks playing the long horns and the oboes. This is a group of Nangma musicians. They had their own musical association. I know one of them, the man wearing dark glasses. He's called Namgyal. He was a very well-known musician in Lhasa. He was a brilliant harmonica player. He also played the Tibetan lute and other instruments. He was blind, and that's why he wore dark glasses. Everyone knew him by his nickname, Namgyal, No Eyes. Another important summer event, and one of the Dalai Lama's favorites, was the annual opera festival held at the Norbalinka Palace. During summer in Nobulinga, I think around July or August, on summer festival, the folk dance, at, uh, and, uh, and also the, every day the military performance. So like any other child, I love you see, the military or say, the performance. Hmm. They are well organized, they are quite smart, like that. Opera, Tibetan unique opera, is a play. So during that uh, period, I have no lesson, free holiday. Then my mother uh, often come because during that period, my family uh, stay in uh, residence in Nopulinga. Uh, they stay there a few days. So I'm very happy. Then after five days, festival finish. The next day, my lesson started. And same time, you see, the fifth day evening, my mother depart. So I feel very, <laughs> very sad. <laughs> that, that, that's the child's sort of experience, like that. For the commoners in Lhasa, participation in some festival events was not really a matter of choice. For the wrestling and weightlifting, the contestants were all from the Dalai Lama's personal bodyguard regiment. So it's hard to believe, given their size and stature. The wrestling was a particularly unpopular duty, as they had to wear loincloths. It was deemed to be shameful appearing semi-naked in public, and especially in front of your superiors. For most, shyness meant they were covered up quickly. But some seemed to rather enjoy it. At the same time as a horse race is being conducted around the city, there's also a foot race. A motley group of men running brightly colored outfits, somewhat unenthusiastically. 
The race is compulsory and is performed as a duty to their landlords. For the Tibetan aristocrats, there are lots of social events to attend at the British Mission, or Deki Linka. In true colonial style, tea was served and even darts were played. Summer was a, a period where everybody had a party to celebrate the summer and to be outdoors. This person playing the dart is my grandmother's youngest, one of the younger sisters. They live up there, playing darts, yes. Now this looks like a party at the British legation or the British mission, the Kilinga, because it's a beautiful garden and then the servant at the back, he's wearing the special costumes which the servants in the Sikkim royal family used to wear. So I think very much they wore this costume at the formal parties. And this looks very much like the senior, yes, it's the senior Mrs. Lalu. She was a very special lady. She was actually a nun. And she fell in love with a member of the 13 Dalai Lama's um, family. And anyhow, she was very kind and she did everything in such a grand scale. And she, she used to visit once, once a year at our home. The British mission closed when India gained independence in 1947. Tibet still had no status as an independent nation and was not recognized internationally. The civil war between the communists and nationalists in China continued. The Tibetan government realized if the communists won, they would not tolerate their religion. However, they didn't want to be seen to be taking sides, so they politely asked the nationalist Chinese to leave Tibet. They were sent off with the utmost courtesy, with parties and free transport to the Indian border. A small Tibetan army was reorganized, new regiments were formed, and they were re-equipped. In 1949, the Chinese Civil War ended, and the People's Republic of China was established under Mao Zedong's chairmanship. One of their first objectives was to bring Tibet back into what they called the motherland. On the 6th of October, 1950, 40,000 Chinese soldiers of the People's Liberation Army invaded Tibet, and the small Tibetan army was quickly overwhelmed and forced to surrender. The issue of the invasion was raised with the United Nations, but nothing was done. Indeed, the international community did shamefully little to help Tibet in its plight. So, the Tibetans had nothing to do but to negotiate with the Chinese. To do this, they needed a, a sole ruler. And so Dalai Lama, still with two years of training ahead of him, was rapidly giving the power to rule in Tibet. Incredible this, a 16-year-old boy was suddenly made the temporal and spiritual ruler of Tibet. The teenager acted quickly and sent delegations to Britain and America, but it was the height of the Cold War, and they refused to help. The Chinese, however, were happy to talk. Fearful that Chinese troops would invade Lhasa, the Dalai Lama instructed Tibetan officials in Beijing to begin negotiations. The 17-point agreement in which Tibet was defined as being part of the Chinese motherland was signed in Beijing without the Dalai Lama's consent. The reunification, as the Chinese called it, was completed when invading forces reached Lhasa in October 1951, and Tibet was conquered. Samdong Rinpoche was in Lhasa at the time. At that time, there are quite a uh, sizable number of uh, Chinese military personnel uh, uh, arrived in uh, Tibet and they have set up loudspeaker radio uh, in Hasa town. So there was a lot of uh, wires going over the uh, houses and um, there's a big uh, loudspeaker. So it was not a radio, but just um, propaganda through a uh, whole the town by covered by the loudspeakers. After the Chinese arrived in 1951, everybody felt that they had lost their way. 
They didn't know what to do. There was a real feeling of tension and uneasiness in Lhasa. The Chinese were becoming more and more oppressive by the day. His Holiness was in a very difficult position in the face of the military power of the Chinese.